For those of you who are joining us for the first time, Science Gallery Bengaluru is a public institution for research-based engagement. And Psyche is our research festival, for lack of a better word, or maybe a living exhibition, if that's what you like, which brings together scholarship and practices across disciplines to think about the wonderful thing that is the human mind. Arun trained as an electrical engineer, read too much science fiction for his own good, and eventually became a neuroscientist. He's fascinated by how the brain transforms sensation into perception and studies this in the Vision Lab at the Center for Neuroscience, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Allow me to mention a few upcoming programs, Damascus Dreams, a film discussion with Emily Seri and Ella Badr Edin on Thursday, 7th of April at 6.30 p.m. And then we have a lecture in Canada by Ravi Mudashetti on Friday, 8 April at 6.30 p.m. Stay tuned to the next weekend because we will be launching our exhibition in Canada. For those of you again who have missed our earlier exhibitions, we offer all our exhibitions in both English and Canada. So there'll be a number of events that weekend too. Do remember to type in your questions in our Q&A box. And of course, we would love to have your feedback during and after the event. And with this, over to you, Arun. Thanks, uh, Jami. I'm uh, delighted to talk to all of you. Uh, let me start sharing my screen. Um, Okay, great. So, uh, can you see my screen? Just checking. Yes. 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 Okay, great. So, um, uh, this is all uh, going to be talked from very first principles. And uh, I want to start by even saying that, well, many times when you're thinking about from the layman's you know, point of view, uh, you know, you might just uh, think, well, what's there to think about perception? You look with your eyes, you hear with your ears, and uh, that's all there is, right? So uh, part of my job is to tell you that that's completely not all there is. And uh, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of things, very interesting things that are happening inside your, uh, inside your head. And... Um, Another sort of purpose uh, which I uh, which I put out for myself in the in the talk is that um, uh, I like to highlight ways in which you can study your own perception, and uh, because uh, very often we are uh, seduced by all the complex machinery that people use to study uh, study the brain and study our perception and all that, and uh, I'm going to focus almost entirely on ways in which you can understand your own perception and play around with it and do stuff with it and all. So hopefully that's going to be a lot more interesting than uh, looking at uh, complex machinery or thinking of complex kinds of experiments. Okay, so let's start the session by uh, uh, by just going through. Uh, let me show you a couple of things and uh, sort of demos. And the first thing I want to show you is that uh, uh, I want to show you proof that your lab is actually in incredible. This lab which you have inside your head, uh, uh, through which you are uh, perceiving and uh, seeing the world, experiencing through all your senses. And uh, for that, let me actually start on a, on a sort of personal uh, note, because I, I grew up reading uh, books of this kind. I hope many of you have also read uh, books like these. And uh, you know, Asimov talks about a universe where the robots are uh, uh, conscious and they have to be governed by certain rules and they have to have ethics in order to interact in a reasonable way with humans. And uh, I was fascinating, uh, fascinated with all that. And um, I think maybe at some level, that's what drew me into becoming a neuroscientist. And if you contrast to uh, where we stand today, uh, you know, we have, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just putting on a couple of interesting things that could be happening, but are not. And so here, for example, uh, we are scanning items at the, at the supermarket using barcodes. Uh, instead of having machines recognizing the items in your basket, you know, they could just see and you know that uh, the machine could recognize that you're buying tomatoes, uh, capsicums, you know, uh, you know, tur dal and whatnot. Right? So, but we still don't have actually uh, machines. And so look at the contrast between the science fiction scenarios. We want robots to be interacting with us in the world. But today, robots are very, very far from that, uh, that place. Uh, for example, they don't really see very well. 
This is one example of what could happen if they were able to see that. Right? Uh, we also type into machines instead of talking to them. We have to uh, type in through these uh, clunky keyboards, and we still can't talk to your phone and say, "Hey, you know, fix up a meeting in my uh, in my calendar on so and so date." Uh, it's all very rudimentary. Right? It's not really so good that you can replace your keyboard and throw it away. Right? We still have uh, machines that cannot uh, sort of move around in our room. They can't uh, tidy up your room, for example. Uh, you know the. Uh, the, the the robots today cannot really pick up objects and manipulate them very easily. For example, a very dexterous kind of task is you know picking up one of those very very flimsy paper cups that you get outside, um, and um, or picking up a very delicate object like an egg. You got to apply just the amount, just the right amount of force to hold it, but not drop it. And if you apply too much force, it will be crushed. So these very dexterous manipulations are also not possible for uh, robots today. And so I'm just going to kind of highlight on highlight these particular examples. I'm not talking about uh, some of the other senses. Uh, there is a lot of interesting things to say about the other senses as well. For example, smelling, touching, and uh, tasting. Uh, we have other senses that we don't really talk about: the sense of balance, the sense of temperature, all kinds of stuff is out there. And so, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to talk about all of those. We'll really focus on uh, seeing and hearing because that's basically what you're doing right now. Right. So let's start with the first thing, which is the topic of even what I study in my own research. And uh, this is just the simple act of seeing. And um, you'd be very surprised to find that uh, when you're looking, I mean, when you're making important transactions on the internet, uh, you will be typically asked to see, uh, you know, and recognize letters which are shown like this on the screen. And uh, if you think about why they are there, or if you try to look up why they're there, they're really there to rule out access to uh, automatic computer programs from entering these, uh, you know, passing this test and uh, creating, you know, free uh, Gmail accounts or making financial transactions, anything that is really important as a transaction to do on the internet, you have to face this barrier, right? And so if you think about it, I mean, you know, to be a human on the internet, uh, you don't need to sort of believe in democracy, uh, have uh, good feelings for your fellow beings and all that. You just need to recognize these distorted levels. And uh, this is serving as proof that computers are just not able to see very well. So why is it that computers are failing so badly at just such a simple thing like seeing, right? Something to think about. And actually, even today, I sort of, uh, you know, if you think, if, you, if I look at these tests, I'm like, well, this is so easy for us. So why is it that computers are finding it so hard? Right? So let's take one simple example, you know, this letter A that you're looking at and think about, well, how is it that we're able to recognize the letter A, right? So, and here's an example that I can show you. Um, here's many, many ways of looking at uh, many, many variations of the letter A. And I think all of us would look at these and say, well, I can recognize all of these as letter A. But, and it seems like we understand what is A. In a sense, we understand the concept of anus, right? And if you look up, if you look at all of these different, uh, if, you, if you look at all of these different manifestations of A, uh, no two manifestations are actually the same. And if you look at uh, the way people write the letter A also, there's lots of variations in the way we write the letter A. But none of us seem to be faced by these variations. We, seem, we, we just seem to intuitively understand what is A. And uh, therein lies the rub. So a computer, for example, would find this very, very difficult to solve because the appearances of A are as diverse as the alphabets of the letters themselves, right? So just to kind of bring the point even more home, so to speak, uh, let's consider what would happen if you really just only went with the pixels of the image, right? Suppose you have a very primitive kind of visual system, right? And the visual system is only looking at the image that is formed on a camera. And uh, if you think about how the images are on the camera, and you try to do vision using this kind of uh, images that are falling on the camera. Well, imagine that these are two axes. Let's just say only a couple of pixels that are being shown at a time. And if you if you look at these two images, these two images are two checkerboards which look very very similar to us. But these are these are checkerboards where one of them is white and the other one is black at exactly the same place. So in a certain sense, these two images cannot be far away, even further away from each other. Right? These are completely different from each other. So this very primitive visual system would look at these two objects and say, well, these are completely different objects. Right? On the other hand, uh, the, the same kind of visual system would look at these two faces 
And because there is so much pixel overlap between these two images, you might actually conclude that it's the same guy. And there's a pretty sad mistake to be making if you're a cricket fan. Right? You won't you won't want to uh, mistake these two people for the same same uh, same person, right? Even more catastrophically, this visual system would consider these two images to be exactly the same animal because the, again the pose is exactly similar, and so these two look very very similar on a pixel by pixel level. On the other hand, if you look at a new view of your dog. You would actually think, hey, it's completely different on a pixel by pixel level. In fact, the match between my dog and that Uber image is actually much more than the match between the dog and the another view of the dog. So these are the issues that actually are uh, causing difficulty to, uh, difficulties to computers. But if you might uh, think about it, well, these are actually not difficulties for us at all. And uh, somehow your uh, brain is doing, uh, you know, doing this all. Uh, doing this all effortlessly and without even requiring you to think at all, right? So let's go ahead. Um, let's look at the simple task of hearing something, right? So again, similar thing. So I just told, I talked to you about uh, seeing and then I'm going to talk to you about uh, hearing. And if I look at this particular sentence, right? We don't pause between words when we speak. If you take a recording of this particular sentence, this is how it looks, okay? And actually, if you look at uh, if you look at this uh, waveform, you see that the silences between in the sound actually don't correspond to the words at all, to the silent to the space between words. So, for example, when I say we don't pause, T and P are actually uttered at simultaneously. Similarly, for example, there's no particular pause between between and words, and so these are the issues that actually cause confusion to computers. Uh, and, if, and the moment people started trying to make computers see or hear, uh, they immediately realized that these are not trivial problems, okay? So this is the reason why, for example, computers can calculate the square root of two much faster than us, but they can't see like us and they can't hear like us. And these two turn out to be like super hard problems, right? So that's the, that's the magic and the fun of this, uh, this sort of, uh, this, this question, okay? So let's go ahead. Why are computers failing so badly at such a simple thing like hearing? And actually, I'm not an auditory uh, you know, perception uh, researcher. And so I had to uh, play around with it to sort of look at, uh, look at this issue. And I was looking at it this morning. And uh, let me show you an example of what I could find uh, this morning itself. So here's a sentence I've recorded. Well, chess are to access. Yes, computers are still moving close to how you see, hear, touch, smell, and taste. Right? So this is the waveform that you can see for that sentence I spoke just now. So again, you might notice that the that the big fluctuations that are there in the sound are not really corresponding very well to what I uh, uh, you know to the to the words and to the units. So that's one sort of confounding uh, factor for a computer when it's trying to recognize what I say. Now I played this exact uh, exact uh, you know audio file uh, into Google's. Uh, speech to text transcription, uh, you know, example page, and this is what I got. So it actually says, uh, "Violet just said maybe to access the best computers are still nowhere close to having." So it's a garbled kind of version. I mean, a couple of things are right, and you know, if you if you look at this, I said in the audio, I said, "While a chess app may may beat you," and you can see that "may beat you" has become "maybe too." And uh, this is a very, I mean, if you think about the error, it makes sense. But then I think all of you, those of you are listening and uh, listening to what I, what I uh, played in the played earlier, you're all able to hear this sentence perfectly well, right? We didn't make any of these mistakes. And uh, this is the exact problem that's happening when you're trying to make computers see or hear. They're doing it, but they're not doing it too well. And um, this is the reason why you don't have uh, very good computer vision. We don't have very good computer. I mean, there is progress being made. That's not to say that no progress has been made, but still pretty bad, okay? So let's jump into uh, sort of, this is all proof that your, uh, that your perception is pretty good and uh, much better than computers uh, today. So, uh, you know, you can take, uh, you can take sort of, uh, you know, you can uh, take solace in the fact that computers are still nowhere close to us. Uh, Skynet is not coming anytime soon. And uh, that's simply because Skynet can't see, Skynet can't hear, it can't do the basic things, okay? All right. So let's talk about a couple of experiments. And uh, I just want to also say out here, if you're, uh, if you're having a question or you want to ask something, feel free to do so. I guess there's, uh, you can type a question into question answer or chat. 
uh, we can make it make it interactive. I'm not in a hurry to finish uh, finish everything that I have uh, to show. Okay, so let's go ahead and do some experiments on this perception lab. Right. So all of you are uh, all of you are here. You have your lab inside your head, and uh, let's. I'm going to show you some experiments that uh, I'm going to run now. And in some sense, whatever you experience is now data. Okay. So you're going to collect data from your own lab, and uh, let's check out what you get. Okay, so this is some experiments with your vision lab. And I'm going to focus on vision again a lot more because uh, I find vision very fascinating. I studied for my research. Uh, I'll show you a couple of examples uh, you know, with, um, uh, with hearing as well, and, uh, but largely we'll focus on vision. Okay, so here's one, here's one example. This is a very famous illusion. And the illusion basically consists of the following. Uh, all of you would agree, I think, that the top uh, square is actually darker than the bottom square. And uh, you know, you'll all stand by it. All of us see the same thing. And now see what happens when I actually block a part of the image, right? And you can see now that um, the top square and the bottom square, I don't know if you can see my cursor. I'm assuming you, that you can. So if, you, if you, you can see the top square and the bottom square are actually the same color. They're the same shade of gray. Okay, so can anyone uh, sort of, uh, I don't know if it's possible to uh, speak up in this uh, format. Uh, does anyone want to hazard or uh, make a guess about what's uh, going on? I don't know if this format uh, allows for people to uh, ask directly. I'll wait for a moment or two in the chat. Yeah, so I'm seeing, yeah, I'm seeing a bunch of uh, responses here. The background image has a role. Yeah, so one of the things that I find really fascinating about this particular illusion is that your percept of the color of some particular position in the image depends upon some other position in the image. That's point number one, right? So your, your brain or your vision is not directly just measuring the pixel values of things, right? If you're only measuring the pixel brightness, well, this uh, these two squares would actually be exactly the same shade of gray. You should not be influenced by the central portion, okay? But the central uh, central portion is influencing your perception, and the question is why, right? So I'm going to try and uh, I'm going to try and unpack uh, what uh, could be happening, and what I would actually say is that this reveals a kind of intelligence that your visual system has. Okay, so what I mean by intelligence. Well, your visual system is basically using a fairly sophisticated logic here to make the inference that I just told. And one of the things that is very interesting about this inference is I have just shown you that this these two uh, squares are exactly the same color. And still, when I take it back, the your visual system basically says, look, I don't care what you heard in the lecture. I'm just going to see it the way I see it. Right? And it doesn't matter if you are coming from North India, South India, you know, you're uh, male or female or happy or sad. It doesn't matter at all. All of us seem see this illusion the same. Okay, so there's a kind of universality about this uh, illusion, right? So the reason why this is happening and this, uh, the most uh, you know the most uh, likely explanation of what is uh, what is happening is that the brain has used a couple of examples, a couple of clues to tell it that the that this portion is actually in the light and this portion is in the dark. Okay, why is that? Because the top portion is directly lit. The bottom portion is kind of showing some shadows over here. And these shadows and the, these highlights and all that actually tell the visual system that the bottom surface is actually in the shadow. Okay, that's point number one. Now, if the bottom surface is in the shadow and still reflects the same amount of light as the top surface, which is actually in the light, then the top surface must be darker and the bottom surface must be brighter, right? So your, what your brain is actually saying is, I'm measuring something, but I'm not interested in the measurement itself, but I want to know what is it that I'm looking at out there. And what I'm looking at can be corrupted by the light falling on it, right? The light falling on it could be less light or more light, but I still want to understand the nature of the surface that I'm looking at, right? And this is a pretty profound point. I feel very uh, uh, thrilled to actually look at this every time and uh, see that you're getting the same, uh, you know, this, this uh, to understand that your visual system is doing something quite profound here. So is that clear? Do, do, uh, do people uh, get the logic of your vision system here? Maybe you can raise your hand or something if uh, that's, uh, uh, tell me that it, it's open, that you that you understood what's going on. 
right? Okay, great. So uh, I'll uh, for those of you who are staying back in the tutorial, you'll uh, I'll we'll have some of these illusions sort of uh, ready for you to manipulate, so you can play around with it and see what's happening. And notice that you've just done an experiment on your perception lab, so to speak. Okay, so let's go into the next one. Uh, the next one is a very, very famous example. I think most of you must have uh, come across uh, this one. And uh, I just want you to focus. My animation didn't uh, come through very well. So focus on the left uh, dress and uh, tell me which color do you see of the dress? Okay. So I'm going to ask how many of you see it as, uh, uh, how many of you see white and gold? Or type the color of the dress that you see, right? Okay, I see a bunch of people saying white and gold. And how many of you say blue and black? Okay, great. So you're getting a bunch of uh, responses here. That's great. So now the question is, why is it that you're... Uh, so the, the interesting thing about this particular illusion is that uh, people fall into two groups. Some people see white and gold in the dress and some people see blue and black. And of course, there's a couple of people who might see blue and gold and so on. It depends on the properties of your display. So if you're seeing it on a nice, uh, a nice display or a computer, you know, a bright computer monitor versus a phone or something. So it depends. So this thing uh, varies a little bit. So the most, and this, this particular phenomenon, uh, this particular dress photograph actually went viral a couple of years ago. Lots of people were talking about it. And the people who could see white and gold could not believe that the people, some, somebody else could see it as blue and black. And the people who saw blue and black could not believe that somebody could see it as white and gold. And that was why the whole, uh, the, this dress phenomenon actually became viral. And this was a great example for, this was a great opportunity for vision scientists. And so lots of vision scientists have uh, jumped into it. People were looking at perception. And uh, the right-hand side shows an explanation that's actually derived from the comic uh, XKCD. And basically this is what they say. The idea is that when you look at the left, the picture on the left, okay, the uh, you don't know the color of the light falling on the image, okay? Because the color of the light falls on the image and then the image reflects the light. And by looking at the image that is formed in your eyes, you've got to figure out what is the true color of the dress and what is the color of the light falling. So since this dress is a bit ambiguous, suppose you believe in your head that light should be generally bluish in color. Then what your brain is basically saying is, if I believe that bluish light is falling on the dress, then a white and gold object will actually produce this image. Okay. If I believe that light is yellowish in color, then typically I'll actually think that the, this image could have been formed by a blue and black dress. Okay. So what your brain is doing is not just measuring the color of this uh, different pixels or the different pixels on the dress, but actually trying to reason what is the real color of the dress. Okay. So if you believe the light is yellowish, then you'll see one color. If you believe the light is bluish, then you'll see another color. And the fascinating thing is we're not in confusion most of the time. It's only in these very, very special situations that you actually look at the image and then two people don't agree on the color. Most of the time we are in complete agreement about the color of objects. And that's the reason is because your brain has enough information to figure out the color of light and then factor it out of the image that you're looking at and understand the real color of the object. Okay. So what's happening here now is that the dress is being seen by two different in two different ways by people who uh, seem to carry this belief that they're seeing generally bluish light or they might be seeing generally yellowish light. And then people have actually tried to, researchers have tried to figure out what is the correlation between uh, why do you carry a yellowish light kind of belief and why do you carry a bluish light kind of belief? And it turns out, and might be some of you might be thinking about this explanation, uh, that actually this is happening by and large when people see uh, this, uh, when people seem to carry this yellowish light belief, these people are usually morning risers and the people who carry, carry a sort of bluish light uh, sort of belief are usually late uh, sort of uh, night owls. Okay, so, and there's lots of such correlations and there's actually to some degree the uh, answers are not completely settled uh, in the literature. We still are trying to understand why is it that people see it this way. In general, how do you understand the color of an object is again something that is not very, uh, uh, something that is not completely understood. Okay, so that was experiment number two on your perception lab. You just did, looked at something, 
you saw that your lab gave you a completely different uh, response than somebody else's lab. And then you're trying to piece together the explanation of why is it that one person sees it one way, the other person sees it another way. Okay. I'm watching some questions uh, trickling in. Uh, I'll, if something looks very, very relevant, then uh, I'll, uh, I'll call it out and then answer that. But otherwise, we can take it uh, towards the end in the question answer session. Yeah. Okay. So let's go ahead. And for those of you who are wondering what is the actual color of the desk, this is actually an actual photo, right? So like you can actually go back and look at the actual color of the desk. It turns out to be a blue, blue and black dress. When it was photographed in a particular shop window and somebody took it, it was looking ambiguous. But if you look at the blue and black dress in some other color or some other kind of uh, illumination or uh, in some other kind of lighting condition, it always looks blue and black to everybody. Okay, so the real answer is actually blue and black. All right. And I think all of you would agree that when you look at the right hand side image, you're you're having no confusion about the color of this. Okay, so that's one. That's another kind of uh, uh, fact. There. Okay, so let's go to another experiment now. This is known as the color strawberries illusion. Okay, and I think again, all of you would uh, probably agree that these strawberries are looking red, right? Anybody, uh, anybody have a reaction to it before I uh, talk about what's going on? And again, the explanation is actually very, very similar to what I just, uh, what we just talked about for the dress. Okay, so you're seeing red. Uh, but if I actually take a pixel of the red strawberry and match it to something else, and this is what I'm doing out here on the right hand side, you can see the here that this gray, it's actually gray. Okay, this strawberry color is actually gray. But then when I don't have this thing, or maybe even, even when I have it, uh, this gray is looking reddish because the brain is somehow understanding that the light falling on the strawberries is actually greenish, bluish in color. And if you factor out that greenish, bluish color, then a gray, you know, a red object, okay, illuminated by this bluish light will look gray. And therefore your brain is saying, hey, I'm not seeing gray, I'm actually seeing red because the light falling on the object is actually bluish. So what your brain is actually doing and what your perception uh, system is doing is not directly believing whatever measurements it's making, but doing something more complex, some more complex kinds of uh, inference is going on. Okay, is that, uh, is that clear? Anybody have a question that I can quickly answer? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead now. Uh, we'll look at a couple of uh, sort of uh, a couple of uh, uh, other illusions, and again, getting at the same sort of basic idea. And uh, let me show you this one another kind of illusion here. Again, this is an experiment on your perception lab, in the sense that I will actually claim to you that all these three cars are actually the same size. And you can actually use your, use your hand or your uh, finger to measure the cars and you'll find that they're exactly the same size. And here's proof, okay? So I'm drawing a line between the front and back of every car. And you can see that the bottom lines are actually exactly the same, okay? So what is going on? How is your brain actually uh, confusing you or making you believe that the, back, the car over there is actually bigger than the car over there? Okay, so by now you must have, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to get you used to this logic that, you're, uh, that, uh, that is going on in your brain. Your brain doesn't care about the image itself, right? So the brain is actually looking at this image and your brain is now again doing a very complex kind of uh, reasoning here. So what is, so just to sort of uh, convey what that reasoning might be. Well, the reasoning that your visual system or your brain is trying to do is to say that, well, this particular car, the car in the front, is actually much closer to me than the car in the back, okay? Yet, they produce the same size image, okay? So if something is much further away and still produces the same size image as something that is close by, then the something that is close by must be smaller and the something that is far, you know, uh, far away must be bigger because they both produce the same image. It's a little bit like the solar eclipse example where the sun is much bigger but then it's blocked by the moon. Okay, and so what your brain is then saying is that, or your visual system is basically saying that the car at the back is big because it's actually further away and still producing the same image. Okay, so that's, uh, and that also tells us something about how your visual system is actually understanding the scene because what your visual system is doing is to extract the overall structure of the scene before it decided 
what what is the size of objects in the scene right because if you are just only looking at the size of individual objects in the scene then all these three cars should have been looking at this looking like the same size but they don't look like the same size and that's because your brain is actually interested in looking in understanding the real size of the object and not just measuring the size of the object okay so i'm trying to highlight now the difference between the measurement that your that is coming through as the image versus the inference or what your brain is trying to conclude based on what it's looking at okay any questions on this okay so uh, let's uh, let's go ahead and actually do a couple of experiments now on our uh, auditory lab so this is now a couple of experiments on your hearing system okay so um, um, bear with me here so what i'm going to play now is actually a sound and this is a effect which is very similar to what i uh, what we did for vision okay so let's see if it works for uh, all of you yeah Yeah. 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 Okay, so can you all type out what word you heard just now? And this is an experiment I'm actually hearing. I'm actually doing online on all of you. Yeah. So all of you can see all this also the chat, right? Can you please type the word that you heard? Yeah. So. uh i'm i'm hearing i'm i'm uh, seeing that a bunch of people have heard yani okay so what is interesting is if you do this on a bunch of people some people hear yani and some people hear the word laurel okay so this this effect is actually known as yani or laurel because some people hear yani and some people hear laurel and the people who heard yani cannot believe that somebody could hear laurel okay and some people who hear, who heard uh, laurel cannot believe that somebody could hear yani from the sound okay so this exact analog in some sense of the dress okay so let's actually try and dig a little bit deeper to understand why is this even happening so it turns out that the information uh, the sound contains components of the word yani and the components of the word laurel okay now and it's carefully constructed it's not just some random thing so it is constructed to actually get to uh, something get into sort of two groups of people okay so now let me now show you the same sound but modulated in a particular way okay yeah 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 okay so what did you all hear all right great so couple of people are saying yani okay so now try uh, now see what happens when i actually change the sound in another way so here what happened was the entire sound was taken and shifted down in frequency so the pitch is actually shifted down now we're going to actually shift the pitch up and now see what you're hearing okay yeah so now you now if you if i'm not mistaken many of you will start hearing laurel okay and so it's the same sound the information is the same it's just been shifted up in pitch or down in pitch and now you're hearing completely different things and that's the reason why so uh, what people what what auditory sort of perception researchers think is that uh, if you're more attuned to certain frequencies of the sound you will hear yani and if you're more attuned to certain other frequencies of sound you will hear laurel and uh, why some people hear yani and some people hear laurel we don't know we don't know that uh, we don't know the personality types or experience that they've gone through or whatever it is okay so part of my reason is to actually present to you these things as open problems i don't think yeah, you know i don't want to tell you that everything is solved and there's nothing to just listen and go home right so these are things that you can actually actively try out on yourself and manipulate the sound see what you hear and so on. okay let me show you one other effect and uh, actually two others and then i'll switch gears into something else uh, and tell you a little bit uh, other different stuff okay so here's another uh, auditory experiment um, what we're going to do here uh, is uh, it's an experiment uh, it's an experiment uh, that uh, uh, that tells us something about speech and music okay so i want all of you to just listen to this sound to, to this uh, to this particular sound and it sounds as they appear to you 
are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. Okay, so this is just a normal sentence being spoken by some uh, by someone, and uh, you all probably heard like uh, that. You you probably heard it as a regular sentence. Now, watch what happens if I take a snippet of this sentence and repeat it. Okay. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are real. Sorry, let me just play the second part. Sometimes behave so strangely. Sometimes behave so strangely. Sometimes behave so strangely. Sometimes behave so strangely. So if I'm not sometimes behave so strangely. So if I'm not mistaken, suddenly this phrase that was just cut out of a regular sentence and repeated suddenly sounds to all of you like music. And uh, so what this tells us is that somehow like repeating a particular sound, even though there is not any very particular music in there suddenly start sounding like music. I hope all of you agree with it. Please say yes or something if you, if you are maybe more interestingly no if you don't agree. Yeah. So it's fascinating, right? So the same sound, you heard it in the middle of a sentence and it just looks like it's fine. And then it, uh, you, you, uh, you, know, you hear it repeated and it starts sounding like music. Yeah. All right. So let me now uh, sort of uh, show you another, a single, uh, experiment where I'm going to test both your vision lab and auditory lab. So basically, uh, it's an interaction between vision and hearing that is very fascinating. It's an effect known as the McGurk effect. And what I'm going to do is to just play the video, and there's some narration that's going to that's going to happen, and just follow along the narration and sort of uh, do the experiment. Okay. Ba. Concentrate first on the right of the screen. Now to the left of the screen. The illusion occurs because what you are seeing clashes with what you are hearing. So I'm not sure it sounded, it looked choppy to me, so I'm going to just play this again. Concentrate first on the right of the screen. Now to the left of the screen. The illusion occurs because what you are seeing clashes with what you are hearing. So I just want to summarize what you might have uh, experienced just to make sure that you've seen it. So what's happening here is that the same sound is coming to your ears and depending on which side you look, whether you look on the left or the right, you will see actually, you will hear actually two different sounds. In one case, you'll hear ba and the other case, you'll hear ba. Okay, and that's happening because online, your visual system is actually saying, hey, the sound is ambiguous, but the vision actually shows the lip movements consistent with either ba or, or, uh, or uh, ba, I guess, right? And uh, you're going to hear whichever you look at. So which you, depending on which you look at, your perception completely changes. Is that, uh, does it capture, did that work for everyone? I'm not sure if the video came through uh, okay or not. Yeah. Okay, great. Ba. All right. So I'm going to actually uh, switch gears a little bit now. And hopefully what I have managed to convey to you is that your uh, visual and hearing systems are not actually just simply whatever you get with your ears or with your eyes, but something more profound is happening in your senses. And uh, uh, you carry that lab inside you. And if you start playing around with the signals that are, that are entering your eyes and your ears, you will actually start noticing that there's lots of complexity to this whole thing. You don't need to really do any complex experiment and so on. So let me show you one experiment that we've done in our lab, uh, by which we are actually able to understand something a little bit better. And uh, I want to kind of take this, uh, take this time to uh, go through with you a kind of scientific journey. How do scientists actually think about a problem and then try to answer it and see how see what they get and so on. So that was my purpose. So I'm going to select a particular study that we did in our lab. So the basic thing that we start with, right? The first step of any scientific study is just start with some observation that you're curious about, right? And all of you have probably come across this particular, uh, these kinds of things on WhatsApp. 
uh, WhatsApp will tell you if you can read this, you have a strong mind. And then there's a bunch of things that are being uh, written here. And you'll notice that these are letters mixed with numbers, but then you're able to read it just fine. So your mind is reading it automatically without even thinking, it up, thinking about it. Be proud. Only certain people can read this. Please share if you can Please share if you can read this, right? So WhatsApp University is telling you to, you know, it tells you that you have a strong mind and then, uh, you know, only some people can read it. And if you can read it, you have a strong mind and so on. Okay, so first of all, let's start with this basic observation, right? Probably many of you must have come across this kind of uh, forward before. So we, we also did. And we started thinking about it, thinking that, well, why is it that you're able to read these jumbled words without a problem, right? So that's our first step. The first step is simply some observation, something that you're curious about, right? What's step two then? Well, the step two was we checked what others have done, right? So if you start looking at what others have done, uh, you start notice then, noticing then that, uh, uh, that, that uh, people have talked about this problem in the literature. So there are published, uh, uh, published experiments about this topic. And when we start reading everything, we start finding that, well, Sometimes if you transpose, if you jumble more, then it's harder to read. If you jumble less, it's easier to read. If you transpose the first two letters, it's actually, uh, if you transpose the first two letters, it makes it hard to read. If you preserve the word shape, then people have talked about all kinds of different factors. Okay, So it turns out that apparently when you're trying to recognize a jumbled word, there is some process by which your visual system, you know, your brain we don't know if it's a visual system or the language system or the hearing system. They're all working together when you're trying to read something, right? So that's also a mystery, which one is working and which one is actually, which one is contributing to this. So we want to understand actually, how is it that we're able to read jumbled words so well, okay? So then um, we looked at the literature and of course, uh, an integral part of checking what others have done is to not believe everything that you read. So you don't want to believe everything that people have said, then if you everything starts looking like a solved problem, because nobody talks about problems that are open and uh, unsolved and so on. So very few studies will be there like that. Most studies will say, we studied this and this is what we conclude. That's about it, right? So then uh, the question is, well, uh, uh, how do we actually understand how we read jumping words? Okay, so, uh, so we want to understand this question. So we said, well, maybe it's not so much the language related factors, Maybe it's something just about our visual system. Then, in other words, when you're trying to read a jumbled word, maybe really you're using your visual system. And your visual system, for example, doesn't care about the exact position of objects in the scene. Maybe it really doesn't care about the exact position of letters in a word as well. And so let's actually see whether we're using our, whether we're actually using only our visual system to really make sense of jumbled words, right? So then how do we go about doing this? How do we go about uh, you know, asking this question? Well, we asked our own question, but you have to actually answer it, right? So we tried doing some experiments. The obvious experiment that you might think of is to say, well, you show two, two words, the original word and the jumbled word, and you say, well, tell me the visual similarity. I can ask a person, tell me how similar it is, maybe on a scale of one to 10. The problem is that when you're actually doing an experiment like that, they might be using their reading system. They might be using their language system. We don't know exactly if they're using only visual similarity, right? So that's the sort of, uh, that's the next step. So you, you think of an experiment and then you've got to keep asking questions, right? So you, you might say that we want to study visual similarity, but there's no guarantee that people are actually using visual similarity when I ask them to do an experiment, when, they're, when I'm asking them to participate in my experiments, right? So how do we know that our past participants are actually using only visual similarity? Well, then we said, well, maybe there's a different kind of experiment that I can do to actually understand visual similarity. Okay. And so here's a, uh, and we took advantage of a very popular kind of uh, effect that we see in the, in the natural world. And this is the principle of camouflage. Okay. So here's, uh, here's an example of this. Uh, there's, a, there's a leopard hidden in the image. Please type yes if you find the leopard. I'll wait for a couple of seconds. And the reason why the leopard is so hard to find is that the markings on its body is actually making it similar to the surroundings, right? You can't be actually analyzing the details of the leopard at all. So you just gotta let just look around and try to find the leopard, right? So the idea here is that, uh, you know, here's the leopard for those of you who couldn't find it. And you can see here that if something is similar to the background, similar to its surroundings, it's going to be hard to find. 
And if something is very different from its surroundings, it's going to be very easy to find. So this becomes a nice way to measure the visual similarity. Right. So then I can take, uh, you know, of course, as scientists, you want, you don't want, uh, you know, complex pictures and too many factors to come to control and everything. So we want to take, uh, go from very interesting, you know, displays like this to sort of more boring displays like this. And so what's happening here is exactly the same principle where I have actually kept two odd one outs. And you'll see that the first one is pretty easy to find. Okay. The first one is pretty easy to find. This is the jumbled version of. So all the background letters are all forget. The word forget is repeated many times. There's two odd one outs. The first one is over here. The second one is a little bit harder to find, right? And it's over here. And if you think about it, in some sense, like you are actually finding these targets without really reading at all. I mean, you're just searching for these targets and the time you take to find the target is a measure of similarity, okay? And so therefore, we can then say, well, F-O-G-R-E-T, is actually a jumbled version of the word forget. And it's actually very similar to the word forget. And therefore it's very easy to, you know, it's easy to read as the word forget. Whereas the other one, which is OFRGT is much, is much more dissimilar to the original word forget. And therefore this is hard to read as the word forget. So that was our basic hypothesis, right? So basically you're, uh, we are actually saying maybe the visual system is what is responsible for you, for your, ease with which you are reading jumbled words or not is not ease with which we or you know if you find some jumbled word hard to read then it's because your visual system finds it finds it dissimilar to the original word whereas if your visual system finds it easy to you know it's very similar to this stored word then you'll be able to read that word better okay so what do we do here what did we do here well so far so good we understood that if you do some kind of visual visual similarity experiment still the basic finding is still observed. That is that if I shuffle some letters, it's actually easy to find or it's easy to read. And if I shuffle some other letters, it's hard to read. But still, there's still a doubt that we had that maybe, okay, I mean, people say that they're not reading, but maybe they're unconsciously reading, right? So when I look at the entire search array, maybe your reading system gets activated and reads all these words at once. So maybe there's still a component of language or, uh, you know, a, a reading involved. And we wanted to completely remove the any influence of reading from our experiment or rather in our explanation, we wanted to check how far we can go by just trying to use visual factors, right? So that's the, that is our goal. So then the step five is just still keeping on asking questions, right? So we said, okay, well, okay, fine. Let's try and do this. And the next question we thought we'll ask is, well, can I build a model or can I predict how fast or slow you can read a jumbled word based on only the shape of letters? So I'm not actually using the word the full word at all. I just want to look at the shapes of letters and using the shapes of letters, I want to actually build this model. Okay, and so that's what I, that's what we did here. So we said, okay, let's let's understand the shape similarities between letters. So here I'm showing you a search array and you can see that T is pretty easy to find, but W is not so easy to find. And what that means is that if I imagine some kind of space of your perception, then T is very, you know, N and W are close by and T and N are far away. And this is actually the map that we re reconstructed from human participants by looking at lots and lots of searches. So for example, if two letters are close by, they're actually similar and the search is hard. Whereas if two letters are far away, then the search is, search is easy and uh, the letters are actually dissimilar. So this is a sort of map of your perception. And it turns out that people are very, very consistent on this task. So uh, whether, you, again, whether, you, uh, whether you're coming from, uh, you know, North India, South India, Hindu, Muslim, doesn't matter at all. And all of you will behave the same way on this particular task, okay? So then we can say, okay, this is how you understand individual letter shapes. And now we figure out, well, how do I put letters together? And uh, we're not uh, doing too good on time, so I'm going to skip a little bit. And basically what we did was to actually construct a model. And this is actually a computational model or a or a mathematical model. And the model basically says, we have seen, others have seen in, this, uh, in these kinds of studies that when your visual system is looking at two objects, the response to those two objects is the average of the two individual object responses. So if I show object one, I get response one. And if I, I show object two, I get response two. And if I show object one and two together, I get the response of one plus response of two divided by two. Okay, that's the observation that people have made. And so he said, okay, fine. So if this is how letters are actually, 
represented, or if this is how cells in the brain are actually representing letters, we can build a model by which we can construct or we can predict the responses to pairs of letters. And so the whole enterprise is to go from letters to longer strings of letters. And that's what we did. We built a model and I'll not spend too much time trying to explain the model, but tell you the result of explaining, of, of using this model that we wanted to understand whether, uh, so what you're showing here is that the, this is the dissimilarity between pairs of letters and it's being explained by completely using individual letters. And so this is still visual search and you want to keep still asking them questions. And so we wanted to understand ultimately, can we understand how jumbled birds are read by the visual system? Okay, so this is the typical game that you see in the newspaper. Uh, you look at a jumbled bird and sometimes you're immediately able to tell and sometimes you take a little longer. And so we made people in our task, people participate in our experiments. Uh, these are all people like you and me. Um, and we made them do a scrambled word task. And so here are some examples. So here, for example, this is a little bit, uh, this is a little bit hard. Uh, this might be, a little, you know, you will see that uh, you can read these words, you can understand what these uh, words are, but some are easy and some are hard. And this is exactly what we found across lots and lots of examples. We find that, for example, this word is pretty easy to read as city, and this word is pretty hard to read as dwarf, right? And so we wanted to see whether the time taken by people to read these jumbled words is predictable by our model. And to uh, and basically what we said is, well, if I see a jumbled version of the word drink like this, if this is visually similar to the word, to the full word drink, then you'll read it very easily. Whereas if this jumbled version of the word drink is actually shown, then this is visually dissimilar. So you'll take a longer time to crack it. Okay, and that's what we wanted to explain. And it turns out that our model works really, really well. Okay, so finally we've sort of reached a doubt proof answer because now what we did was to predict the time taken by people to actually read jumbled words using the letter model. That is, we are using visual search and letters. So we, there's no doubt that people could be reading them. There's, I mean, there's, there's actually, there's no chance that people could be reading in those tasks. So we are using some uh, measurements and a model. And on the y-axis, I'm plotting the observed responses. So I'm able to predict how long people take to read a particular jumbled word. Okay, and the answer is basically that jumbled word reading is explained completely using letter shapes and nothing else. So that is, we are not able to, we are not able to see any unexplained, uh, you know, aspect of the responses, which means that your visual system is completely driving this whole thing. There's no space for the auditory or the language system to really contribute in your speed with which you read jumbled words. Remember, of course, your auditory system is contributing and of course, your language system is contributing, but not to jumbled word reading. Okay, and so I hope it's sort of, uh, you're able to appreciate the different steps involved in actually conducting this uh, scientific study. Let me show you all the steps at once. And you can see why scientists are, uh, are usually, uh, scientists keep saying, ask your questions, ask your questions, keep asking questions. And that's because a large part of our process of doing science is just doubt our own stuff, doubt our own answers and keep asking the questions. And the other thing I also want to show, want to also highlight with this is, this is a study that we've conducted just very recently, a couple of years ago. And uh, a large chunk of the study is completely done using a, just a computer, right? I'm not using any uh, complex uh, equipment. I'm not poking electrodes into your head. Uh, we're not doing anything fancy. We're just using a computer. And so uh, I just want to highlight that it is completely possible to do state-of-the-art you know, research on your own perception lab. Maybe you can use a couple of others to check whether your perception is the same as others or not. But you can do all these experiments on your own. And so let me just wrap up there uh, to summarize what I've uh, uh, you know, told you so far. You have an incredible perception lab in your head. We don't understand how it works. And you don't need complex equipment to study it. And all you, and, you, know, all you need is you, right? You just need to uh, play around with whatever you uh, you know, whatever you're seeing and hearing, and uh, of course, by extension, um, all the other senses, and we'll start noticing that there's lots of unexplained stuff out there. Okay, so just to sort of, uh, let me just wrap up in one more minute to uh, say, to come back to that original sort of graphic I showed you, and uh, think about, well, what's the use, right? So, um, I mean, this is something that we also get asked a lot. We're studying basic science. 
and uh, you know i want to sort of show you you might be wondering well what's the use of all this like okay fine you're trying to explain jumbled words okay fine your perception you know experiments are interesting but what's the use right we get this we get asked uh, this question a lot and uh, to that i give uh, i give many answers to different people uh, one of the answers that i like a lot in a quote that i uh, recently came across is that you know if you have an application then your applications will hit targets that nobody else can hit maybe you can develop a great app or a great uh, process or a great test or something but basic science often reveals new discoveries and uh, those targets are something that nobody else can see and this is something that we never knew that was even there right and so for example um, we find that uh, the work that we've done on trying to understand how we read uh can potentially be used to understand reading disorders and why children might have difficulty reading or maybe even adults have difficulty reading and uh, that could be why that could be because your visual system is somehow not processing letters or shapes or something in a different way uh, so those are the kinds of application that might suddenly turn out by uh, something that uh, basic science can discover uh, of course there's a great uh, sort of value in just understanding something for its own sake and so i don't think that should be dismissed we all have a desire to sort of understand the brain and of course understanding the brain is not like understanding you know your hand or leg or something it's it's understanding ourselves uh, uh, the brain is who we are right and so there's a great value in understanding ourselves and of course more practically it helps us understand disorders and of course ultimately maybe makes machines more intelligent and um, there's still a long way to go from that but at least by understanding why machines fail by understanding how we see or hear these are two sides of the same coin okay and i'll stop here show you a sort of uh, graphic of uh, all the people who are uh, in our lab if you are interested in this kind of work please do get in touch and um, these are all the agencies that uh, funding agencies that uh, fund our work and help us do what we love and i will just stop there thank you arun that was quite incredible um and good fun i mean you know and some of this as you very rightly noted i mean from your examples uh, these are things that get thrown at us right like where either to affirm uh, to give an affirmation of self belief like i can read what others cannot or um, you know a, a trick of the of the of the brain and especially given the sort of uh, ubiquity of social media and other kinds of media now compared to say when you know even we were growing up um everybody has access to this right like and and um, uh, in ways in which um, people earlier earlier didn't have and i think it raises um, you know and so please type your questions in the q and a box while i uh, abuse my my position as uh, you know moderating this event to ask the first set of questions and make observations um it also sort of allows us to raise an interesting observation which is that perception in in some ways is unreliable right like because we are relying upon perception uh within the context of what we have learned right and so and we are not necessarily taught to question perception i mean we are sentient beings of course since birth but we are not necessarily aware of or made aware of um how one might understand perception or you know uh, yeah and so uh, and so learning how to read it seems to be a very very interesting thing because at the end of the day and this again for those of you who will return to um return to our lectures you'll hear me sort of you know repeat this phrase is that you know at the end of the day we constitute ourselves with the very many things that we come across along the way right like some of them we inherit uh, both genetically but also socially and culturally uh, geographically others we kind of pick along the way add to ourselves and and you know we create ourselves and if what we learn is dependent upon our perception and comprehension and cognition and yet if that itself is something we first need to interrogate then you know it 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 um it makes sort of the constitution of the self in you know, or, or the psyche for that matter right a, a far more complicated matter um um i mean i, I ne need not use the word more because it is a complicated matter nonetheless but this is an additional sort of you know interest in it so uh, ad additional interesting aspect to it so i'd just like you to say a few words about um you know the unreliability 
right? And bandwidthability, of course, it's not it's not about creating a, a sort of shallow, trivial binary between reliable and unreliable, or true and false. Mm -hmm. But you know what I, I think what lies in in between, or, or rather, what constitutes as unreliability is exactly what you showed us in this lecture. So could you just sort of pontificate, for lack of a better word, on it for a few seconds before we go to the next questions? Uh, sure. So I. Um... I usually like to actually uh, tell people that um, uh, perception is very reliable uh, because uh, everyone experiences the you know the stuff that I show in the same way, and yeah. uh, uh, and you know I, I do this you know, sort of deliberately because um, uh, perception is often sort of uh, in the in the popular sort of uh, mind I guess in the mind of you know lay people um, it's thought of as an unreliable thing and you should sort of uh, everyone sees the world in the in a different way and you know we all bring our own perspective into the world yeah. and in a certain sense there's a there's a very deep universality to our perception and actually it becomes even more amazing because everyone has grown up in a different visual world yeah I've yeah. seen you know I might have seen lots and lots of one type of object and less of some other object and certain types of scenes more than you have. And yet, despite all those differences, we seem to come and be able to talk about everything in a common currency. Mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. like in some sense, if I tilt my hand or if I say that my hand is tilted in a certain angle, everybody has the same sort of, uh, you know, sort of, uh, everybody, I mean, it. so what, what at least at the level that, of perception that we study mm -hmm. looks like the perception becomes is becoming universal despite very different experiences and perhaps even the very different beliefs and very often these illusions that i uh, that we uh, that we find uh, are very carefully constructed and so like for example color illusions you can't just get color differences so easily like you might go out with your friend into the market and without thinking you'll talk about the same thing because your perception is all, often assumed to be the same yeah. and, uh, but of course uh, having said all that uh, there are of course individual differences in perception i don't like to talk about them but there are they are there yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you know and uh, they do influence what we uh, see and perceive and talk about and uh, one very common example that i think many of us would relate to is for example that you know before you get glasses like these like you are seeing the world blurry and mm -hmm. assume that everybody is seeing the world blurry right and so for example like this mischievous child in the back of the class is behaving mischievously simply because he can't see the damn board and he just assumes that everybody else cannot see the board the same way as he does. Yeah. And it's only when you wear this glass that you realize, that, oh my God, this is what I've been missing. Mm. You know, there are, and this is just a more common kind of experience, but you know, lots of, uh, uh, there are disorders of perception yeah. uh, where uh, for a, a great example is uh, uh, what's called face blindness. Mm. And a case where people cannot differentiate between faces. So mm. for example, think of it like when you go to the zoo, all the lions look exactly the same, but I'm sure that's not what lions think of each other, yeah. right? But face blind people actually think that way about human beings. And so mm -hmm. it becomes very difficult for them to actually recognize, uh, recognize others. They recognize people by the sound of their voice, the way they walk, but they cannot recognize people by their face. Mm -hmm. and, so, and many face blind people are very high achievers. For example, like uh, I was looking up, you know, people like uh, the famous face blind people, uh, Oliver Sacks is face blind. Oh, wow. Brad Pitt is face blind. So, like, the, I mean, people, you know, you'd be face blind and you won't know it. Hmm. You assume that everybody sees faces the same way as you. And you're struggling and you assume that everybody is sort of coping with this and, you know, uh, sort of getting along. And yeah. so, uh, certainly, like, I, I would say that, yeah, I mean, I mean, you should not be taking it for granted. Precisely. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, a lot of language, a lot of things we do with each other and communication always takes perception for granted. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think that's a, that's a that's a fabulous way to kind of you know uh, um, sum it up, which is to say that you, you, it is not something you can take for granted. There can be different. There is significant agreement on what we perceive. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of working it, it backwards, but I think what, what you said otherwise also, right? Like where there are differences, differences, differences needn't be judged in a sense, right? Like, and, and, and that, that, that there, there is a, uh, there might be, there might be distortions 
as you just spoke about, and Oliver Sacks, by the way, was news to me. Um, it, it's uh, so 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 you know, it, it, they might be distorted. They might be sort of you know, uh, 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 you know, abilities that have been compromised for various reasons, um, or you know, uh, things that that you know, at least uh, someone who's not working very focusedly in the areas that you work in and, and your colleagues of yours work in might not comprehend, but they're there, right? And and but but one needn't kind of from the extrapolate to everybody perceives things differently and therefore every perception is equal, right? Like the, I think that that is where the problem lies. And therefore I think your summation of it, that it is not something to be taken for granted. And I think that's a that's a that's a very good way. And and how does one not take it for granted? And how does one, you know, slowly in one's own life begin to begin to unpack it. And I think it's it's a lesson to take for no matter what, right? Like I mean it, it's and that's what that's what I, I guess um, research in a way teaches you, right? Like that that you you pursue things, you don't take things for granted. You ask questions, and you know, love that thing. Ask questions, ask questions, ask questions. Okay, so I'll 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 ask you questions from our audience now. So Akshay Dikshit wants to know: Can we augment machine learning using data from human cross-modal perception? Uh, yeah. So um, I think uh, I think in general the answer is yes. So many times people do, um, uh, there's an entire field of computer vision where uh, if you put a human into the mix in mm -hmm. any, it improves computer vision. So even if you ask people to click on the likely location of the object or click on the category or mm -hmm. any information that humans can provide to machines definitely helps machine performance. Mm -hmm. So uh, in fact, uh, uh, something that is, uh, very surprising to me when we started looking at computer vision versus human vision is that nearly all computer vision models actually see the world in the same way. And, and whatever way in which they see the world is completely different from the way we see the world. Mm -hmm. and humans all see the world in the same way. They're all in very good agreement with each other. So mm -hmm. there's some very fundamental difference between computers and humans. Mm -hmm. um, if you ask a human, if you ask a machine to, you know, you have a collection of a billion photographs and you want to, you want to pick the one photograph, you want to find that one photograph and you gave a, one of the billion to the, to the computer, it will go match that photograph perfectly. And hmm. uh, email, computers are great. On the other hand, if you say, hey, fetch me all pictures of my dog, you know, from my photo album, <laughs> uh, that's a hard task. And like humans will do this better than computers. Hmm. And uh, humans continue to do that, that kind of task. The more abstract task, humans are really great. Hmm. So uh, I guess that's what uh, that's what I would say there. I think uh, there's definitely a possibility to augment and we are looking for ways of improving machine vision uh, using our you know, brain data, behavioral data, all kinds of data. And uh, it is possible, yeah. Okay, wonderful. So the next question is uh, how, if someone wants to contact you and to know more about your research. So I think my team can put um, Arun's yeah, uh, and official you know, this, ID in the chat. Yeah, just search for uh, search for our lab, Vision Lab IC or my name, if you can find our web, web, website and ways to contact us. Yeah. yeah. The next is, do psychedelic drugs affect these visual perceptions? Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so like, I mean, this is... Uh, in the in the glorious case of uh, self experimentation uh, by visual visual scientists, so people did experiment on uh, psychedelic drugs, and uh, they found uh, uh, there was actually interesting sort of studies where they modeled the patterns that people could see, you know, when they uh, when they were under the influence of psychedelic drugs, or even for that matter during dreams. Uh, yeah. And uh, people found that uh, those patterns could be explained by certain idiosyncrasies of your visual uh, cortex and its organizations. For example, uh, uh, certain kinds of waves expand as you go into the periphery, and those are all related to the way your brain sort of organizing the center of your gaze versus the versus the periphery. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it, it, there's definitely an effect. But in fact, I mean, like, um, I mean, virtually anything that you eat, uh, you know, uh, eat or ingest also can. So, for example, um, uh, coffee, you know, coffee, uh, chocolates, all of these things affect your cognition in general. I mean, I don't know what, I wouldn't really, so at least I don't like to think of the level of perception that we study as being very, very labile, because mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense to me that you should have a perceptual system that is so under the influence of like your cognition and so on. Your perception should be stable, right? It's mm -hmm. something that you've got to rely upon. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want uh, just because you're happy or sad to be influenced, your perception to be influenced so dramatically. 
Mm. So, uh, but but uh, yeah, I mean, many many things that we eat do affect uh, certainly cognition, certainly attention, mm. uh, perception. We don't know how deeply they penetrate, and maybe mm. they don't. But uh, yeah. yeah. Well, food coma is a common term. <laughs> huh? Food coma is a top common. True, term. true. Maybe I mean that could be. I mean, yeah, <laughs> that could be a thing. <laughs> or or you know, nervousness right. after coffee or delirium after right. you know eating too many chocolate. I mean, so like uh, the other thing I want to also say that. perception for example i mean yeah. you know, for uh, people have seen that your ability to detect a very very faint visual stimulus yeah. is much better whenever your heart beats <laughs> up and down so like in the interval between two heart beats or in, in the interval between two breaths your yeah. ability to detect a visual stimulus is slightly lower but you know most of the time these visual stimuli that you're looking at are all very very what we call as above threshold so they're not really dim or hard to see but the moment your perceptual system is challenged then of course heart beat breathing all these internal signals do actually affect your perception fear for example is a great way uh, in yeah. if they, if things are ambiguous so again the overall sort of uh, you know framework i uh, would say there is that when the evidence is weak mm-hmm. then your beliefs all come into the fore so, yeah. you know for example like you have a weak you're 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 going in a dark uh, sort of forest or something then your fears will actually make you see dragons and monsters and all that and that's because there's just incomplete information in your senses yeah so you're trying to make up for that for that missing information and so then your beliefs all come to the fore and they drive your perception like crazy yeah but then if if the sensory evidence is very clear like most of the time when we are in the broad daylight or you know in, uh, in you know in everyday situations the sensory evidence completely drives your perception mm. but the moment your evidence becomes weaker then uh, all your beliefs come into the fore and that's uh, you know a lot of uh, beliefs of fears right um, yeah fear is a huge uh, huge thing right i mean somebody who's scared of snakes will see snakes in the dark and you know for all you know if their their perceptual system is strongly activated as if they're really looking at us yeah 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 we uh, in fact i just finished reading a book that you know someone who's going to speak later in this series shared with me he's he's translated it um and it, and and you know uh, this person lived with 7 years of such a uh, of 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 a, of a, of a condition when you know they they saw things mm-hmm. where you know uh, uh, yeah but that, we will come to that later there's a question waiting by jyoti which i think will be the last question for today because we're going to um uh oh my god no more questions are coming in okay let me ask jyoti's question first um wonderful so regarding face blindness what jyoti wants to know is that is it always sort of you know is it kind specific in a sense right like so can an indian difference so what does one do yeah. with the with the observation that an indian may be able to differentiate between yeah, indian yeah. faces but yeah. east, not east asian faces um yeah and there's another question but we'll come to that later yeah so um yeah thanks for that it's a great question so um uh, what we you know you're you're absolutely right that in a way if you want to understand face blindness you all you need to do is to look at somebody from a race that you're not usually used to looking at so mm. for example for indians uh, you know people from china japan look completely identical to us and you can be assured that they have the same perception for us and so it's not something that uh, we are uh, special or anything at all and uh, it's what i think is happening there is that your you know faces are very very similar visual stimuli and so if you want to differentiate between faces you got to start noticing the variations that actually occur in the faces that you are seeing mm-hmm. so what might i mean what we think is happening there is that you get used to noticing the variations across indian faces and those variations actually don't occur in chinese or mm-hmm. japanese faces mm-hmm. and so they get tuned to the faces that they see and so in a certain sense we are face blind on chinese and japanese faces and uh, this is a well known effect actually it's called the other race effect mm-hmm. so and you can actually see it working on you like say for example you go to live in another country yeah. uh, initially you don't uh, you can't differentiate you know people from europe from one country to the other but you live for a couple of years in europe and you can say ah that that that, that person looks italian that person looks german that person looks uh, french and so on Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and here we all have these uh, very common kind of uh, ways of uh, looking at people and say, "Oh, he looks Bengali. He's a pakka, you know, yeah, yeah, pakka yeah. Bihari." And you know, we do this, of course, by the way they talk and all that. But also, just the face itself 
is mm. uh, contains lots of information and we are able to easily tell that and we don't know what features we are using even yeah 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 I mean, it really used to be the case, right? Like, I think probably not not um, ours, but a generation prior to us, but they all looked the same. And it's, it was especially sort of you yeah, know, yeah. across racial uh, boundaries. The next, and definitely the last question now, uh, regarding the experiment you described, have you worked with people who have synesthesia? Yeah. Uh, those who relate mm -hmm. to letters or words through more than just the visual sense? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a great question. The answer is no. But uh, I actually uh, would uh, like to use this uh, chance to say that, uh, you know, perception and uh, sort of differences in perception are very, very poorly characterized, uh, characterized in India. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, we don't know the prevalence of face blindness. Uh, even doctors that I uh, have talked to, or, uh, you know, it's, face blindness is not a, it's not a debilitating condition. So, like, it's just not characterized very much. And so very often a person could be face blind for their whole life and not realize it. Uh, color blindness is also another one like this. So yeah. sometimes color blind people look, go for a long time not realizing that others don't see colors the way they do. Hmm. And so what I would actually say is that uh, we should somehow crowdsource or sort of have some way of, um, uh, you know, cataloging, you know, variations in perception. And uh, particularly so in the Indian context, because we actually don't know the prevalence of uh, many of these conditions. So, for example, synesthesia, I'm okay. sure that people with synesthesia in India as well, but it's only ever been studied or reported in the West. And uh, there could be some uh, differences in the way that, or there could be some very uh, uh, unique ways in which people in India sort of are affected in their perception or differences in perception. And, you know, I think it's important to characterize and understand these variations. Mm. There's a very interesting question. Sorry, I'm going to I'm going to sort of. I'm uh, happy to continue. Okay. <laughs> no it yeah. is an interesting question because this the yeah. what what this person wants to know is that have any of these experiments related to alphabets done on visually impaired people using Braille, for example, right? Like so, moving the letters back and forth, etc. So has that so, has been yeah. done? So I I mean I don't have a very direct answer to this, but I used to study the sense of touch. That's what I did my PhD on. And uh, you know, in the sense of touch, if you if you take raised letters of the alphabet, uh, they're not very easy to distinguish. And this is whole this is the whole thing that was actually driving the development of Braille as a language because the Braille uh, the Braille uh, uh, the embossed dots in Braille are actually very easy to recognize using your sense of touch. Whereas mm -hmm. the if you just raise a letter and you ask people to scan the letter, it's very confusing and there's lots of confusions that happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, uh, yeah, so I think, you know, so there are lots of parallels between touch and vision and mm -hmm. uh, it's been seen that if you cannot, uh, if you cannot recognize, so, so the way in which uh, you, when you touch an object, uh, a spatial image is created, unlike hearing, hearing is very different from vision, right, but touch is actually very similar to vision because you grasp an object and it's a spatial sort of percept that comes across and if you think about it and it turns out that pattern recognition in touch is actually the visual cortex gets involved. And mm -hmm. so if you stimulate the visual cortex when you're touching something, your recognition gets affected, even though it's a visual cortex and it's supposed to be only you know, handling visual information. Mm -hmm. and, uh, at some level, all the senses are mixed in, uh, which is another kind of bizarre and interesting right, right. about, uh, about the yeah. senses as well. Yeah. yeah. No, quite incredible actually and I, and I think to be made aware you know to be made aware that we as you very beautifully put in the title of your lecture that we carry with ourselves a perception a, a laboratory for perception and if you become more aware of it we are likely to kind of you know not only not take it for granted but also you know in a sense question ourselves make our observations more precise be a bit more tenuous about our claims and and you know many things that follow with it and I think that's uh, you know, it would be wonderful to have this, you know, uh, this kind of an approach in a way communicated, you know, at a, at a younger age when, you know, um, in many ways, your opinions are being formed, your fears are being formed, but also your perception is in a sense consolidating. Um, you know, the, another point that you raised towards the end about, you know, the fact that we haven't really mapped the population for many kinds of things, you know, a long time ago, I remember um, when I was being treated for a fracture, my doctor who... Uh, or the orthopedic surgeon who was treating me, um, you know, he he would go to the world's best conferences and, you know, was sort of qualified. Uh, well, let me put it this way, he could have worked in any private hospital. 
and sort of you know done well like most you know and we all know what so we all know in a sense the economy of the private hospital but he used to work in a municipal hospital mm -hmm. and that was again a time when municipal and government hospitals were very very you know reliable good places where one could go get treated right and i and and i after after i got better i asked him i said so why do you continue to work here you know uh, i mean you know uh, sort of your world recognized in your work uh, in your field etc and he said look where else would i get such diversity of cases mm -hmm. From morning to evening, not only do I get a number, but I get a worker who has crushed his hand in a sugar mill. I get a worker who has done et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Get an accident case. I get someone who's, you know, fallen from a construction site. This has happened. That, like the, he said that when I, when, I, when I make an observation, I have at least 300 x-rays to back it. Right. And that kind of richness of... You know, I mean, of right. course, this it is just incredible to be to be for for making new knowledge, right? And I think this 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 observation holds true for also the kind of things you are trying to understand, mm -hmm. and therefore this kind of mapping I think will can be richly done just given the diversity, right, of circumstance yeah. of um, genetic sort of descendancy of of yeah. the range of things. Um, and one, one, for example, I mean, I, uh, on the topic of, you know, uh, slightly, you know, altered perception, for example, yeah. it's well known now that many um, neurological disorders yeah. uh, have this uh, altered perception as well. So, for example, schizophrenia is another yeah. good case where not only the hallucinations are different, but also the visual perception at its core is different. Similarly, mm -hmm. people with autism, people with uh, ADHD, uh, there is evidence building up and we are also starting some studies of that kind. Mm -hmm. where we know that uh, perception is different mm -hmm. and uh, you know in many ways it's just not been characterized i mean it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's exactly. usually usually the focus is on the more kind of uh, i guess the more serious uh, manifestations of it but there is altered perception definitely for sure yeah yeah I think again, sort of a good phrase. This it's not been characterized enough, right? Like, or, or we haven't worked on that. And I think it's a, it's a call for you know, more research, better research. Yeah. This is, and, and you know, also I think a lot of this uh, research, a uh, lot of this research actually is something that, I mean, doesn't require it. Doesn't require any fancy equipment. It's just yeah. something that if people. Uh, sort of even self-report their perception, that itself would be a very interesting bit of this. Incredibly, yes, absolutely. Well, so much to be done and so much to, you know, uh, uh, yeah, and I think that's what's exciting um, yeah. to, to have. And so thank you very much for spending this evening with us, Arun, and for this wonderful, um, you know, um, making us aware of our labs yeah. and look forward to working, you with, you, working with you in the future. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.